Today I'm gonna tell you how I made a central hub to control my entire home, what I wanted to achieve, how it worked over the last two years and why I decided to get rid of it and make a new version. Hi, how's it going? My name is Sebastian and today I'm gonna tell you about this thing behind me. It's a focal point of my home, the main hub. This is where all smartness happens. I made it about two years ago before I started this channel, so unfortunately I don't have much footage from the design and assembly process. But it took me a lot of time and it was boring as hell, so you don't lose much, no worries. During this time, it works as I intended. I've never had significant breakdowns with it, but daily maintenance was pain in the ass. I constantly had to tweak and improve things, so it's hard to call it smart home, more like home with special needs. I want my system to be as maintenance free as possible, that's why I decided on an extensive upgrade. As a matter of fact, I've already done it, however, it was my biggest and most complex project so far, so I couldn't just quietly throw it away. This is the PCB, or rather a panel of PCBs, and it was made by JLC PCB, who happens to be a sponsor of this video, but more about them later. I spent a few long months on this project, and I'm mostly proud of it. That's why before I installed the new hub, I wanted to tell you what this version taught me, what I did right, and what not so much. Apparently people can be divided into those who never learn, those who learn from their mistakes, most of us, and those who learn from the other people's mistakes. I hope you belong to the third group and you will learn something from my mistakes about which I'm gonna tell you today. This video will be a little different than usual on my channel. I wanted to talk casually about the project, the engineering process and smart home systems in general. You can consider it as an introduction to this project. Let me know in the comment what do you think about this format on my channel. Should I do more such videos between subsequent projects or should I focus only on completed devices? Alright, let's finally get started. My main goal was to create a centralized system, at least it's a wired part. That's why almost all cables in my home are linked in these two boxes. In this one there are fuses. And in this one is located the main control unit, the Raspberry Pi with home assistant on board. Here information from all switches, windows, doors and presence sensors are collected and here the mains voltage to supply all receivers such as light, outlets, heating and so on are controlled. As you may have noticed, this mess of cables is hard to miss, I haven't connected all of them yet. I wasn't able to, I only had two years for that, you know, and apparently it's not enough. So the first lesson for you from this video, if you don't finish something right away, it's hard to get down to it later and it doesn't apply only to smart homes. But the truth is, I haven't done it yet because I don't have all devices like electric windows blinds for example installed at my home yet. Besides, I plan to make a new revision of this hub for a long time, so connecting all of this just for a short while was pointless if you ask me. On the Everyday Astronaut channel is an awesome interview with Elon Musk, which inspired me to make this video in the first place, during which Elon gave a few minutes lecture on the engineering process. In a nutshell it comes to five points. Step one, uh, make your requirements less dumb. Step two, delete the part or process step. The third step is simplify or optimize. Step four, which is accelerate cycle time. And then the final step is automate. And these five points literally blew my mind because they made me realize how much I did this project the other way around. There's no point in wasting time meeting dumb requirements or optimizing something that should be removed. I recommend you to watch the entire interview because it's really informative and inspiring. Link in the description. Now knowing these points, let's talk about my hub. But let's start with the things I believe I came up with well. I connected all digital inputs via Ethernet cable from the top. Their state is constantly monitored by this STM32 microcontroller. If any input changes state, for example someone wants to turn on the light in the room, information about it will be sent to the appropriate output, SSR and therefore the lights, turns on. And right after that, the home assistant will be notified that the light has been turned on, so that it could update the appropriate entity. In the initial approach, each state change of the input was sent directly to home assistant. There the decision was made on which light should be toggled, and in the feedback, the STM32 was instructed to turn on or off a specific SSR. It was definitely more flexible and easier solution to modify, however, I wanted the critical elements such as lights to work independently from the home assistant. And that's why STM32 takes care of it locally. The main advantage of doing it this way is that the lights will work even there is no communication with home assistant whatsoever. Of course I'm gonna lose remote access and the entities won't be updated, but 
household will be able to function normally until I solve the problem. Additionally, this solution is faster. The lights come on or off with almost no delay at all, what cannot be said about the initial approach. And with communication between the hub and home assistant, I have the biggest problem, because I had dumb requirements right from the start. But I'll talk about it later. It deserves a separate paragraph. This is the main reason why I'm doing this upgrade at all. Let's proceed. In this version, I did one more layer of protection against possible hardware fail. With Home Assistant, STM32 and all chips fail, I can disable the logic with these switches. They connect a specific input directly to a specific output, bypassing everything in between. It only applies to the lights because in that case, one input and one output, switch on the wall and the light source, can be clearly defined. It's not so evident in other cases such as temperature control. In that case, the input has an analog value, not a simple on or off. And as I mentioned before, I consider the lights to be a critical element in my home. And although it seems to be useful, I didn't use this functionality even once over the last two years. It greatly complicated the entire project, and in fact, it turned out to be unnecessary. If so, according to the rule, try very hard to delete the part or process, I remove it from the next version of my house. Instead, the main microcontroller, in theory the most failure-prone part, will be easily swappable and it will be programmed and ready to use waiting for a possible failure. But that's only one part of my project I wanted to dispose of. Of course, there are more of them. LCD display where I can view the history of all events, turn on or off any output and read the current status of all inputs. The hub will be locked in a box, therefore our local interface is totally redundant. So let's throw it away. LEDs that are placed next to the relays. It looks nice now when they are exposed, but they will be behind a metal lid, so I'll never see them anyway. Therefore, 64 LEDs and 64 resistors are saying bye-bye. A buzzer. It was supposed to inform about the problem such as lack of communication with home assistant. The problem is, I can't hear it in most rooms in my home. The hub is installed far away from the living room and the bedrooms, so the usefulness of this buzzer is also, to put it mildly, questionable. SD card where I can save the entire log as a TXT file. Making a FAT file system on the SD card and saving the log as a TXT file was a nightmare. And as you may have guessed, I used this card for the first time today to record this B-roll. The connection between STM32 and the Raspberry Pi is way too extensive. I connect all 40 pins. All interfaces such as I2C, SPI, UART, Power and many many GPIOs. I did it, as always. Just in case. In the end, I used two pins for communication and GND. All these redundant features compelled to use the large microcontroller with a lot of pins and interfaces to be able to handle all of them. It also complicated the PCB layout and significantly extended the development process. I also wanted to make this project available for you guys, but explaining how it works would be a terribly complicated. In addition, currently I don't even remember every detail of this project myself. The next version will be way simpler. According to the rule, simplify or optimize. I removed most of the features that turned out to be useless in the last two years. Now, before getting into the software part, let me tell you about this big PCB and the sponsor of this video, GLC PCB. If your project, like mine, consists more than one PCB, you can put it together in such a panel. It's a great way if you'd like to outsource assembly somewhere. Usually it's not mandatory, but it'll definitely make it cheaper. You will also benefit from it if you solder your boards yourself with a stencil and a solder paste. In one go, you can apply the paste on the entire panel, which significantly speeds things up. And this beautiful panel was made by GLCPCB. The quality as always is top-notch. I used their services long before starting this channel, which I think is good quality indicator. Thanks GLCPCB! Right, let's move to the software issue I have, the thing that pisses me off on a daily basis. The main reason why I decided to upgrade my hub at all, namely communication with Home Assistant. Obviously, my device isn't an official integration supported by Home Assistant, so I had to create my own communication protocol. It required quite a bit of code for STM32 and a custom component in the Home Assistant. And to be frank, it wasn't straightforward. It took me the most of the development time. I had to be sure that I anticipated all possible scenarios and the communication was as robust as possible. And it was, to the first update. Home Assistant has a growing database of natively supported components. At the moment, there are almost 2000 of them and a lot of developers keep them up to date. Whenever there's a problem, it is reported by the community and fixed almost right away. That's why the use of the official components is relatively safe. A custom component like mine, on the other hand, 
is a whole different animal. In that case, I had to supervise what changed during the update and make modifications to keep it consistent. Most of the time, the changes are cosmetic, minor, but sometimes they are more extensive and time-consuming. This led to me doing the update of Home Assistant every few months. And when I'm gonna do it, I have to be sure that I have spare time and there is no one at home. If something fails, for example, there will be no light in the whole house, I need time to fix it. It definitely shouldn't look like this. A smart home should make life easier, not more difficult. On top of that, Home Assistant will soon stop supporting direct access to GPIOs on the Raspberry Pi at all. And unfortunately for me, this is what my component is based on. So I had three options. Stop updating Home Assistant completely and accept that I won't be able to play with any new features. Stick with my custom component and spend time on maintenance, as I've been doing so far. Or change the approach entirely. Build the device from scratch, but this time make it better. And of course, I choose the third option. The second revision uses only natively supported and official components. Thanks to that, hopefully, it's gonna be much more maintenance free. All the hard work of keeping it up to date will fall on the shoulders of Home Assistant developers. The new version is also much more or less over-engineered, which will allow me to make this project available for everyone, and explaining how is it working won't take several hours. Therefore, if you are curious about this project, you should definitely watch this video next, where I talk about it in great detail. However, if I haven't managed to make this video yet, the almighty YouTube algorithm will choose something else for you.